Now we are going to quickly pivot uh, to Danielle Allen, who is right there. Hi, hey, Jeff. How, How are, are you? you? How are you? I'd call you Madam <laughs> Prime Minister, but you're not the Prime Minister yet. Um, Danielle, Danielle's good. Thank you. Exactly. Uh, uh, many of you know Danielle Allen, of course. Um, she is. Uh, uh, professor at Harvard, obviously director of the Safra Center for Ethics. Um, she derives most of her spiritual and intellectual fulfillment by writing for The Atlantic, um, but she also does other <laughs> in, in life. Um, and most recently, and, and a lot of you have read what she's written, she's led a, uh, a group of experts on what seems to be a pretty influential plan for opening up the U.S. called the Roadmap to Pandemic Resilience. And so we are all very eager to hear uh, about this roadmap, um, tell us. Um, tell us. Try to do it in in a minute if you can, because of our our tight time frame. But tell us what you advocate doing. Sure. You know, I'm actually going to start with something the prime minister was saying because the concept of pandemic resilience is exactly what he was getting to. Our globalized world left us vulnerable to a pandemic, and none of our economies had built into them the health capacities that they needed for protection against a pandemic. So in the same way that 2008 showed us vulnerabilities in our financial system, and then we had to correct for that and restructure the economy, exactly the same thing is true now. So the goal should be that by the end of this crisis, we actually have pandemic resilient societies and economies. So as it happens, the near-term solution, the answer to your question, is actually the same thing as the long-term solution. So what's the near-term solution? Partly it's what we all already are focused on, a massive surge in health capacity. We've been working on that. We're doing pretty well on that front. But then secondly, the part we're not doing as well on is massively scaling up the capacity to test, contact trace, and provide supported isolation to people so that when they test COVID positive, they can reasonably step out of the workforce for two weeks. If they're in a role that doesn't give them paid sick leave, they need financial support, job protection in order to isolate and help reduce rates of transmission. But the goal here is to scale up testing to such a scale that it can actually replace collective quarantine as a tool of disease control. So our report puts out, we've got the highest targets that are out there. We think that we need 5 million tests a day. That's what it would take to bring the transmission rate to 0.75 consistently. Right, but, 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 but 5 million tests a day sounds like science fiction, given that we haven't even done 5 million tests in America through the whole, according to our, the Atlantic's own COVID tracking project, we haven't done 5 million yet. Yeah. Uh, where was the failure here? Like what, 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 what broke down to, to the degree that we're in this crisis? So, you know, I think there are a couple of intersecting things in all honesty, and I don't think one can, I mean, there are leadership questions. There is the question of the White House and what they saw to do, but there's also questions about how CDC has operated. So there was a mistake in the very, very beginning around testing. And the result of that mistake was that we ended up with an insufficient testing supply and so the CDC put out guidance that tests should only be used for symptomatic people and really only for the most symptomatic people, people showing up in hospitals. And the moment that the CDC did that, that was a market signal to test producers that there was no market for their tests. And so right from that beginning, we had this massive supply chain problem where nobody was getting a signal that suggested what the demand should, would appropriately be. So we weren't targeting demand appropriately, so therefore producers didn't have good reason to invest in repurposing equipment or expanding their capacity, and we just fell further and further behind. So at the point that we started falling behind with that original sort of failure of market signaling, it was really important that the federal government step in with something like a war production board, we call it a pandemic testing board, um, and start working on those supply chain questions. So we're seeing movements in those directions, and that's a good thing. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to build on those. The number's not science fiction, the number is doable. If we could solve the coordination problems of the supply chain, we could get to 2 million a day based on the existing footprint of testing. To get higher than that, we do need to build an innovation pathway for testing. And that's where the sort of breakthrough with saliva tests is so important. So to about two weeks ago, the FDA approved the first saliva test. That is a massive simplification of the testing process because then people can do it for themselves. You don't need another human in PPE sticking a Q-tip up your nose. You yourself can spit into you know, a test tube. If the test tube has viral deactivator in it, then it's no longer a biohazard. And so all the transport issues that come with getting you know, the samples to labs disappear. So there's a way to simplify the testing process. And then the scale at millions a day is really, I mean, it's not science fiction. It's within our range. It's a coordination problem, a supply chain problem. Um, it's not breaking laws of physics. 
Right. Well, let me let me let me talk about another uh, uh, qualm that people have about another aspect of what you're talking about: contact tracing. Uh, uh, your your friends at, at at the law school are probably talking about this to some degree. At what point um, do you worry that uh, contact tracing, that you know, app downloads, and and, and you know, and, and sort of uh, the government knowing where you are at all times? When does that give you worry about the imposition of uh, of, of privacy violation. So there's no need for those kinds of tools or that kind of surveillance for effective contact tracing. So that's the important thing to say. So let's back up a step and think about what are the civil liberties issues at stake here. Currently, we have one tool in our toolkit for disease control, for a disease as infectious as this one with the kind of infection fatality rate that this one has. And that tool in our toolkit is collective quarantine, okay? And we've seen that it's profoundly economically devastating. It's important to recognize that collective quarantine is also a massive civil liberties infringement. We've all lost our rights of association, our rights of mobility. So the ideal thing is to replace collective quarantine with targeted isolation of only those people who are positive. So anybody who is negative can be moving around freely and have their rights to associate so forth with appropriate, you know, wearing masks, social distancing and so forth, but nonetheless, get those rights back. So contact tracing is what makes that possible. It's what makes it possible to find positive cases. Every time a person tests positive, find their contacts, test them, and then only put in isolation the people who are COVID positive. Um, and then that is the way you reduce the, imp the impact on civil liberties. So what makes contact tracing okay? In the first instance, the bedrock for it is manual contact tracing. All right, and this we've done forever. It's a standard part of public health. It was a hugely important part of the HIV AIDS crisis. It matters that contact tracers be people who are trusted in the communities where they're working. So this is not about standing up a federal force of contact tracers. This is about activating community organizations and having collaborations between county public health officials and municipal leaders to build up contact tracing personnel. It's also an employment opportunity, an upskilling opportunity into the health service core for lots of people. And so contact tracers have a job really of working with a COVID positive person to have those conversations about who they've been around in the last couple of weeks that might involve intimate details and to talk through how you go about alerting your network of friends that they too should get tested. Um, and again, the model is sort of HIV AIDS. So there is a kind of intimacy element that's involved here. And for that, you really do need in-person human contact tracers. That can be supported with technology, but that technology support where somebody, for example, say uses a Bluetooth based app on their phone that can alert other phones they've been near that they should go get tested does not require sharing that data with the government. OK, so that's the important thing. You don't actually have to share that data with the government in order to run contact tracing. Right. So let me let me ask you this. And we, we've talked about this in a slightly different context. There, there's a strong streak in American life of um, a, a libertarian streak of radical individualism of leave me alone or, or however you want to frame it. I'm not, I'm not seeing like maybe in New York city, it works, maybe in Boston, it works, but I'm not seeing large swaths of the country, uh, uh, being necessarily ready to answer invasive, intimate questions about who they've been with over the last couple of weeks and their movements, even from a non Orwellian, non, non machine, uh, not, not non big brother kind of eye in the sky, but just another human representing a government agency. Don't you worry about uh, when you're putting this forward that you're going to meet a level of resistance based on that American ethos of, of, of privacy and individualism? Well, the truth is, I honestly think that a part of contact tracing should also be do it yourself contact tracing. I think there's another part of our ethos, which is about the barn raising, the proverbial idea that communities help one another. And frankly, if you've exposed somebody to a highly infectious virus that they could pass on to their grandmother and cause a fatality, I think we have a moral imperative to warn each other. So the real focus is about peer to peer sharing of warnings. And I think even individualistic America could understand the, the moral imperative of peer to peer sharing of warnings. Do you, do you think that we in the media, um, and the media is not one thing, obviously, but do you think that the country focuses too much on these protesters, you know, give me liberty or give me death people uh, who might get both uh, <laughs> at the demonstrations? Um, do you, in your, and you're a very careful watcher of, of American behavior and American ideological behavior, do you think that most Americans are actually um, with the program in a kind of way, understand the seriousness of this and understand the rate of infection has to be brought down radically? So I think we have a real problem around knowledge in public education and particularly around things like case rates. 
Um, so right now we're all sort of tracking, you know, is the case rate number coming down and so forth. But actually the kind of those numbers are simply a reflection of the number of tests that we actually have. So we're not, in fact, appropriately informing the American public of the seriousness of the disease, the level of prevalence. So I think we need to focus on excess deaths, for instance, and really be sharing that data with the American public. So I think that the understanding of how dangerous this disease is still quite uneven and that there is significant public education that we continue to need to do. Okay, and that comes to my final question for you, which is about national leadership. I don't quite understand how all of these things that you want to get done will be able to get done when the federal government is led by someone who um, speculates openly about the injection of disinfectant uh, as, as a means of curing the disease. I mean, you seem to be up against uh, an immovable object in this sense. So I think it's really important that we have to activate all parts of our federal system for this. This really is a whole of government um, responsibility and effort. There is a role for the president and the White House, but the governors need to lead testing programs in their states. And the fact of the matter is at this point, if the governors set their testing targets high enough and feed that information into the White House, it will drive changes in policy. And so that's really where we need to focus is making sure governors have the information they need to set the targets that they need and to be really clear about the coordination problems that they have. One of the biggest challenges here is that the CDC is really only inching away from that initial kind of therapeutic picture of testing. They're only inching away from that rather than striding mile by mile to the control picture. And the way to, so that's, so now, you know, the White House is kind of caught between these two different pictures and visions. And so we really need the governors to be advocates for that massively scaled up testing program that will permit us to open the economy, keep it open stably and achieve that sort of pandemic resilient economy that we're trying to talk about. Right. Uh, Prime Minister Allen, thank you very much. For <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Danielle, thank good to be here with you. <laughs> good to see you. We'll see you Take soon. Take care.